welcome to uh, a new crash course. Um, so here's a bit what we're gonna uh, talk about today. Um, so it's gonna be a quick intro to Flux uh, and the crash courses. Uh, and then today we're gonna talk about a little bit about pack selection. Uh, so kind of like the first step to a project, um, especially if it's gonna be like some sort of use, uh, business case or something that you're gonna end up manufacturing uh, and ideally selling um, of pack selections, kind of the first step. Um, and so we're gonna be touching on a little bit about parts, um, how to sort of sharing in collaboration, how to work in Flux. Uh, a little about the community library or how to collaborate with the Flux community, uh, how to leverage that. Uh, we're gonna demo a few uh, sort of tools uh, and things you can um, do. So on top of that, we're gonna have a roughly 15 minutes for Q&A and then we're gonna hang out um, sort of as an optional thing. Um, so answer any questions that you might have, discuss projects uh, or kind of whatever. Um, feels at the moment. Right, so a little bit about me. Um, I'm Nico, uh, I'm an electronics engineer uh, and product evangelist at Flux. I worked as an EE mostly in the IoT industry uh, so for, for a bunch of years. Uh, and then in my previous experience, um, I spent roughly four years working in a remote environment, so in a remote team of electronic engineers. Um, and it went so well that I decided to change flux, <laughs> let's say, to change how that, how that actually works. Um, so for those of you who are not sort of aware of, of uh, what flux is, most of you probably are, but just uh, browse through this uh, real quick. So flux is a browser-based electronic design tool uh, or EDA or ECAD um, that start, started being built uh, basically two years ago. Um, so we're kind of taking a, a different approach to uh, traditional uh, ECAD uh, tools. Uh, so it's an integrated workflow. So it means that you have schematic um, PCB and also simulation within the same tool. So there's no need to be jumping around different tools uh, to do different different things. Sort of, so model collaboration, what we mean by that is um, sort of, being able to collaborate not only with people um, within your team, but also with a wider um, with a wider community, um, and being able to version control, uh, command, um, and everything basically real time. Uh, and one of the key things that we kind of push uh, a lot is reusable blocks, so not having to reinvent the wheel over and over. So being able to get these blocks and then you reuse them and share it with the community so that others can also benefit from it. Oh, there you go. Um, so what was different? So nesting, again, which means that you can um, have parts that become modules and the modules that you reuse um, and everything is seamless. So th there's this concept of uh, nesting. A part can become a module and part can have other parts inside. Uh, we're gonna talk about that a little bit later. Um, another concept, the concept of rules, um, which is kind of a DRC, but much more uh, powerful in the sense that um, everything works real time. So there's no need to wait until the end of the design. So you can actually affect uh, the design with the rules in real time. Again, we're going to talk about, about it a little bit in the demo. And simulation, uh, which is in tool and it's always on. Uh, so there's no need to again, change tools, export different formats and then re-import and go back and forth. It is, it's always on, so it's always there. Um, so as I was saying before, this is a three week course. Uh, by the end, um, the idea is we're gonna build a BMS accessory for the Raspberry Pi. Um, and you can keep on uh, going through this course with us and use the provided reference designs that we're gonna share uh, with you during and after the, the call, or you can create your own version um, and, and share. That would be amazing. So timeline real quick. Today we kind of go uh, with part selection and validation. So everything about parts. Uh, next Friday, uh, it's gonna be schematic uh, and, and structure and design. So how you get the schematic done. 
Um, and then the following Friday, uh, we're going to talk about uh, board layout or PCB layout um, and how to use sub modules and rules. The cool thing is that um, we have this sort of um, perk where if you finish this or it, or other PCB uh, of yours by the end of June, uh, you'll get a few perks. So some swag, and also we're going to pay for the first um, prototyping batch. So who doesn't want free free prototypes <laughs> and free swag and free swag uh free swag everybody wants but free prototypes were the, with the right audience i think um so where are we going to learn uh so first is how parts work uh so this is kind of a quick intro for whoever's not fully aware of, of how they work it's kind of a different concept so uh it's worth it to to go over it uh, so how to search and validate, how basically how to use the library uh, and, um, and basically some tools to make the most use of the library, uh, and basically the community, right? Because the library is also a community library. So before we get into the demo, I wanted to, to share a few uh, key concepts. Um, and by the way, feel free to, uh, I probably uh, last already did it, but uh, if you have any questions, just share in the chat uh, so that I can, um, address them in due time. So a few key concepts. Um, so I talked about kind of nesting uh, in the, at the beginning a little bit, uh, but sort of the idea is that in Flux, parts can be ever more complex um, and within the same umbrella. So how, what do we mean by that? Uh, so everything starts with the terminal, uh, and you can think of it kind of as a pad, uh, which is basically what helps the part interact with whoever is using the part, right? So the simple, the simplest part would be a bunch of terminals um, with a footprint, right? And when I import this part uh, in my design, I will just see a few terminals. Uh, and when I go to the PCB, I will see the footprint for that for that specific part. Um, but I also I can also once I construct this first part, I can also uh, add more parts onto it. So let's say I have three parts, I can create a, another new part, um, which consists of three parts and they're connected in some way. And I add terminals to communicate that to the, um, to the outside world. So that kind of becomes a module, right? So you can see that there's terminals in the module, but also parts. Um, and then I can import this module and this module will look like a part. Um, so I'm gonna, show a little bit how that actually works. So basically, yeah, the terminal is kind of the cornerstone of the parts, kind of the simplest thing that you can actually put. Um, and then you build on top of that. So basically a bunch of terminals plus a footprint becomes a part, and then a bunch of parts become a module. Uh, and that module can grow and grow and grow, and it also can be infinite, right? So it can be a module that inside has another module, that inside has another module, that inside has a part. Um, and this is built in, the tool, but there's no need to do anything about that. Um, it's just how it works. So Anderson so, was just saying real quick, he was saying, so three sub layouts that do one job. Oh. It sounds like you get the concept then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So some, some of like basically the key elements. Uh, so when you got, when you guys jump into trying out flux, this is going to help you navigate sort of how it actually, how it actually works. Um, so the symbol is basically what kind of the, the image uh, or the face of a part. Uh, so when I import a new part or module to my um, to my project, I will see its symbol, um, which can be whatever uh, whatever makes sense for that specific part or module, right? It's kind of its, its face. In this case, uh, it's a USB um, a USB connector. So the symbol. So if I open it. So if I open and go inside this part, um, I will go into its schematic. So inside the schematic, it can just be terminals and a footprint, as I was saying before, or it can actually be a sum of parts. So in this case, it could be the USB um, connector plus um, a voltage regulator plus a, a, a bunch of decoupling caps. Um, and the symbol is potentially the same, right? Uh, so this is this is gonna all make more sense when when I run through the demo, and then the footprint, um, which is sort of the 
representation of that um, of that part, and then a model which is kind of easy to understand, which is this three D representation of the footprint. Um, sort of basically super quick, the community library. We're gonna be watching this in the in the demo. Um, this is how you search parts. Uh, so you have the search bar uh, and a few filters. So and the, this is basically what each filter means. Uh, so you can filter by parts that that you own, filters by part that you've starred or, or favorite uh, or liked, or you wanna um, think of it. Parts that contain footprints. Um, so basically parts that you can use to create your PCB or parts that contain sub layout, uh, which basically is a module. Uh, so it's not only a footprint, which is a single thing, but a sub layout, which is a whole sub module with a few footprints plus potentially traces. Um, you can filter also by if it contains a simulator model or not, uh, or if it contains a 3D model or not. Um, and then just, yeah, I'm gonna fly through this so that we can get into the demo. Um, so each, every project part module, uh, everything can be shared. Uh, and you control if that whatever part module project is shared or not and with whom and what uh, sort of, um, so what, what what can people do with, uh, with that? So what permissions uh, they have, you can write, rewrite, comment, just view, whatever. Um, and sort of Git-like uh, approach is that you can also, clone parts or fork parts. So basically cl cloning a part means taking a picture of the current status and then making it your own. Uh, so putting us your own project or forking uh, someone else's part or project, which is basically you, you keep all the history of all the changes that were done from zero to uh, that current status. So let's see this working a little bit. All right. Let's move some things out of the way. Okay, so what we're gonna try and do is build uh, by the end of the uh, of the crash course, this um, this little accessory, which is basically a BMS hat for Raspberry Pi. because it contains a battery uh, that can power a type of Raspberry Pi for um, a limited amount of time. I'm gonna share this as well in the chat. If anybody wants to take a look. Um, okay, so here's the um, schematic for this uh, specific project. This is also linked from the um, website that I shared before. So basically here, what, what it contains, it contains a uh, battery management IC um, a few USB ports, uh, so type A, type B, and type C. Um, the um, connector that you're gonna use to connect to, uh, so the uh, pin header connector that you're gonna use to connect to the Raspberry Pi, and a bunch of protection, bunch of protection circuits. Um, so here, um, and a bunch of transistors um, for power, uh, and a switch. So let's start doing that in flux. Um, so let me create a new project. Then I'm gonna call by BMS. Okay, so just to, to recap, what I'm, what I'm gonna try and, and, and show is a few tools of how can you uh, make use of the library, uh, a few tips and tricks um, to get the most uh, out of it. Um, how can you use it? How can you leverage it? Uh, how can you add to it um, if you need to? So basically set up everything so that next class uh, or next session, um, we can create the schematics. Uh, so we're gonna go through parts this time next schematics and following the layout. So going back to this, um, I'm gonna take a pick, uh, for example, this uh, DW01, um, which is the uh, protection diode. So this is kind of the, the happy scenario, the happy path, right? So if I click uh, DW01, um, someone already 
um, created this part and shared with um, with everybody. So I can basically just use this part now. A few things about the part. Um, so here is who actually made the part. Um, this is the, the amount of times that it has it has been used, the amount of time that it has been stored, and some characteristics. So this part actually contains a footprint, uh, which is great uh, because we're we're gonna need it. Um, so this is what I've been telling you, um, what we showed before. So this is the symbol, right? In this case, it's just a sort of basic IC symbol, uh, but I can go inside the part um, by right clicking open. Um, and in this case, it's just an IC, uh, it's not a module or anything. What I'm gonna see is oh, sorry, a bunch of terminals. Um, and if I go to the PCB, I'm gonna see its footprint. This is the time to... Performance team, clean up on aisle five. Performance team, clean up on aisle five. <laughs> All right, let's see. Here we go. Let me refresh it. We have our best people working on this topic. <laughs> All right, it's something we're going on here. It's te technical difficulties. Um, Brooks here, I'd like to take a moment to uh, remind everyone yeah. that data. <laughs> right, let, let's try again. Okay, I can show the PCB right here, probably. Okay. What's going on here? That it's going on with this footprint. Okay, let me try again. All right, I'm gonna to move to another part uh, and then figure out later what, what might be going on with this one. Yeah, that's strange. Yeah. That's, no. <laughs> All right, so let's find another one. Um, so we also have a few transistors here. Uh, so this uh, 8205, uh, 8205 transistor. Um, so it's basically a dual channel MOSFET. Um, so if we go back to our Flux project, um, 8205, uh, so there's, there's nothing like it. Um, so we have a few options here. Um, so what we actually want is a double and channel channel and channel transistor. Um, so we can see uh, that we have a few options. Um, for example, we have one here. Um, this is a dual array um, and channel transistor. Uh, this is 20 volts, which is similar to the other one and 7.5 amps, uh, which probably just, just works. Um, so we can grab that one. Um, oh, I didn't put the A here. Okay, go. Dual. Here we have more options. Uh, or we can use uh, this other transistor. So basically, the point that I'm trying to make here is um, you can just search for the specific part number, uh, which it might or might not be in the library. Um, but you can also search for the description of the um, 
of the part. Um, and many times, uh, actually most of the times, the part is gonna be already in the library. Um, and then if I actually click on this part, for example, I can see uh, a little bit in pricing. So I can see that it's in stock, which these days um, is helpful. Uh, and I can see the pricing and everything. So at this point, uh, I'm confident that this part I will be able to source. Um, and it's basically the same um, parameters uh, that the other transistor has. So it's a part that I can use for my for my design. Um, so we can actually open this one. Um, again, it's one single part, so it's just a bunch of terminals. Um, so if you go to the PCB, here we have the, um, the actual PCB um, for this part. All right, am I on the uh, 3D model? So this is a 2D view. Um, so this is one of the options that we have for, for searching the part. Um, And basically going through uh, is how we start constructing. So we're gonna need a bunch of these, but I'm gonna sort of touch on a few key parts. Um, and then I'm gonna just share um, by the end of the class, the project with all the sort of parts uh, already placed so that we can play around with, with all the parts that we just placed. Um, so going back to the uh, schematic, uh, we have a, type C um, USB port. Um, so this one is generic, so there's no part number for it. So we can just go to Flux um, and search for a USB C. So here we, we start seeing the first, um, the first few differences. So this part is a sub module and this part is just a part or a footprint. Um, so I can actually drag um, this one first, which is the module to uh, showcase a little bit what I was talking about. So if I open this part now, I can see that it has a USB-C. Um, so here you can see, so this part that I just um, selected, it's a Amphenol, uh, has a part number, so it's basically a USB-C. Here, eventually, you're gonna see that, uh, the data sheet for this, for this specific part. But it also contains some other parts. So it contains um, a, this is probably a 3.3 volt um, voltage regulator uh, and some sort of protection, I, I imagine. Um, so yeah, you might filter. So, when you go back to the uh, to original project, you see it as a single part, um, which basically makes it super easy to encapsulate functionalities. Uh, so this makes the schematic way cleaner um, while keeping the same functionality. Uh, so if I go to my PCB now, to the, to the view. So what I can see is that I have the USB-C with all the extra circuitry plus um, all the traces connected to it. So basically if I, if I want it, I could start tracing directly from um, the sub layout. Again, this is gonna make a lot more sense uh, next class when we talk about how, so basically a few strategies to kind of encapsulate this type of submodules to make semantics, semantics cleaner uh, and easier to read. Um, which is kind of the, the goal. Um, or if I grab this USB, uh, again, you can see here that this one's a footprint, the previous one was a layout. This part is just a USB-C um, connector. See, there's nothing else. Um, it's just a USB-C. All right. So, now, so it's, it's good that we can get parts from the library, uh, but it also is um, something that we have to validate. So I actually use this part uh, in one of my designs. So I, wish I wanted to share sort of my experience with this part. Um, 
and a few things that you can you might encounter uh and how to um how to work around them so if we go to the pcb um of this specific layout um let me uh, show remove the few overlays um so that rep is the, is the top copper copper layer um so what you see here is that the drill hole um so the edge of the pad is too it's, it's way too close to the drill hole um and if the accuracy of the hole is not good enough the pads will be just tiny um so i had experience manufacturing this in china and the pad was way too close to being um ripped out so so basically what happens now so th this part is someone else's part right so you can see here on the um and, oh wait sorry so here um we can take a look at the part and we can see that it was created by someone else so i i do not own this part uh so someone else created this part um so if i try to open it um and that person didn't give uh give me edit access i i won't be able to do anything with uh so i can't trace i can't um i can do anything with it so what 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 options do i have um unless jarwin just gave me share access and i did modify it okay no um so I, I can't do anything with it. Um, so I wanted to change the the, 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 the width of this pod for myself. Um, so in this case, I have a few options. So one option is uh, I can fork this part. So if I fork this part, basically I will create my own copy of it. It will be on my, like owned by me. Um, and it will keep the whole history of the part. Uh, so I can see everything that the owner uh, did to create this part. So if I fork it, I will preserve the whole history. Um, another option is that I just um, clone it. So I can just clone this project. I will have my own version of this part, um, but I won't have any of the history. In this case, I don't need the history. Um, I just need the part because I'm, I'm going to modify it. Um, so depending on what you're trying to achieve, one like either cloning or um, or forking will, will make sense. Um, so if if it is a part uh, that that is maybe from some from your team, and then eventually you're going to use that part as a um, let's say gold standard, uh, you can fork it so you keep the history, and then eventually the other person will drop the part, uh, and you can keep. Um, using the the new fork, or if you, if you don't know whoever, whoever created it and you want your kind of clean slate, you can clone it um, and then go from there. Can I can I interject as well, Brooks? Here, guys, um, we will eventually at some point um, do merging. So if you fork something, it, it it has a semantic link, and you would be able to merge it back. If you clone something, you break that semantic link. Right? It's completely different now. There would be no notion of sort of a GitHub merge. So just a little, that's the difference between forking and cloning. Mm -hmm. And there's no, there's no, as I was saying, it's kind of a snapshot of the current moment, the clone. So there's no, you don't know where, it, you don't know where it came from. Uh, you know nothing. It's kind of like a copy paste, pretty much. Um, so in this case, um, I can uh, now, for, because this this project is mine, um, or this part is mine, I can change um the pad size um so i can modify it um i can change the size i can move it um i can do whatever um whatever i wanted uh so i, I we actually had a class around rules so what i'm what i'm just uh, what i'm just doing um sort of clicking and, and adding different parameters to each of the parts um, it's something that uh, I covered um, previous, uh, last Friday uh, on the 
rules uh, deep dive. So if you haven't watched that, um, it's probably going to be um, important uh, because I explain again how all these doing rules are. Uh, but just as a quick refresher um, or a quick uh, context for whoever is not fully aware. Um, so rules in Flux were kind of different than they work in other tools. Uh, so it's not just a that you put some intentions. For example, I want this to be the minimum width. I want this to be the maximum. Um, I want paths not to be greater than, or I want holes not to be smaller than a certain amount. Um, you can also affect the design um, with rules. So for example, um, I can create a rule um, that I touch on specific by I already know the, the names of the um, of this pad. So this pad has a a, a name sort of, or a pin name, uh, which is called shield. So I can actually select for this um, pad specifically, uh, and then add a um, specific rule, right? So I can make the pad whatever one point five. Um, so essentially, what I just to recap what I did, I cloned the part because I found that the pad was too small. Um, so I had my own version of it. And then I'm creating a rule, which basically affects only this specific part. I mean, I could, I could put potentially all paths if I wanted. Um, or I can select um, one part specifically. Shield. Um, so that allows you to change the pad, um, the pad size. But also there's a, um, there's actually another, another way of, of doing this. Um, so let's say that you don't want to modify the part itself. So you don't want to create another, yet another version of the part. Uh, so I'm going to just um, move back here. Um, so I don't want to create another version um, of this part. I just, on my PCB, so only on my design, I want to modify this part, right? So what, one reason why 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 could I, why would I want to do that? Um, for example, I'm in this only in this project. I'm working with a different manufacturer uh, that requires, for example, the pads to be bigger because it's um, it's less precise. Um, so I could modify the part, or since this is this is only affected in this project, I could um, modify the part only in my project. Um, so I can do something very similar with rules um, than for what I did before. So I can grab and say, okay, uh, this, this was J1 probably. Yeah, J1. So I'm selecting J1. And then from inside J1, I'm going to select um, the shield pad. Um, so you can click on here um, to go to how to make all these selections that I, that I just made. I always, again, suggest that you watch the previous deep dive on rules uh, to learn a little bit about how they work. Uh, but here's all the um, syntax on how you select specific things, how you select nets, how you select pa paths that, are, that belong to specific uh, component and so on and so forth. Um, so you have all the, um, all the syntax over there. So going back to my rule, I can do the same here, right? I can add the size and then make it 1.5, right? So what happens, uh, and a few key things about this. So I'm only modifying this part on this project. So if I go back to the part um, and I open the part, so I'm going back to the original part now, um, and on the PCB, nothing changed. But in my project, um, the path is changed. Um, again, this is a way um, of doing this for this, for, for only for this project. But the cool thing about doing this with rules and not doing this with um, just going in and modifying the path as you would in, in, in many other tools is that I have a rule that I can trace back to. And I change, for example, uh, shield pad. Uh, and I have a description, uh, increased pad size um, due to manufacturer. 
So there's a very clean record of why I modify this part um, and a very clean record uh, to undo it if I want. Uh, I can disable the rule and this goes back to normal. Um, so this is very, very helpful for when you're doing many of these changes, there's a track record of all these changes that like what changes were done and why they were done and they can be rolled back um, without, without any issues. Nico, to um, satisfy my OCD, can you write a selector that that targets all of the um, the sort of mounting pads around the yeah. Um, I think they call if I recall correctly. It's been a while. CC one. Man, it find the names. Opponent J one. This is oh, I, I'm navigating the the object. You have to select each one, but oh, they're not grouped. Okay. No, they're not grouped. Yeah. So it well, is our just, creator, whoever he may be, Jarwin, not naming names. Uh, yeah, they are located on the mounts folder, uh, Nika, because these are like mounts pads. So if you click on that, but one, they're, they're, get... they're all in the mount folder. Yeah, SH1, I guess, HH2, uh, HH3. Yeah, this, these are the ones, uh, CCH. Oh, SH1, sorry, yeah. SH1, SH2, and SH. H. Yeah, H4. H4. One, two, three. Oh, I'm missing the. Now you need the little hash, hash sign. Yep. All right. Boom. There you go. Okay. Thank you. I, um, <laughs> I mean, another option would be so you can create a group. Um, so if I go to the modify the part, I create a group for all the shield. Uh, all these four um, paths, I could make a rule that targets the group, not each one individually. Uh, but in this case, um, they're not grouped, so uh, I can't. I can't do that. Um, but yeah, again, the idea of this is to show you a few alternatives of how you can find a part, figure out if something is wrong or not, uh, and then a few alternatives uh, to improve it. Um, so it's kind of the typical scenario or the, the typical uh, process here would be, I create my own part, I do it from scratch, or I modify it all from scratch. Uh, I need to, to copy it um, and create another entry uh, and things like that. In Flux, that, that's not necessary. Uh, there's many different ways of leveraging other people's works. Uh, and for example, if I created this, this part of my own, I could uh, also publish it for um, for the whole community to to see uh, and, and eventually use. Um, so basically, avoiding uh, much of the work. Um, so, and then um, kind of for writing a bit later, I also want to give some um, some time in the end. Um, but I'm, I'm going to do this one very quickly. Uh, so. We have this is basically the, the, the IC, right? The, the battery management IC, which is uh, SW6124. Um, so SW6124. Um, so it's, it's, not, it's not here, right? So I, I couldn't find this part. Um, there's no alternatives for it. Um, so that's kind of like the, the most work scenario. Um, so here at this point, so it's just no, there's no one, um, there's no there's no part for this. Um, so you have kind of have two options. So first, the the shameless plug. Um, so you can actually we have a, a Slack community uh, that we either I last already had already shared the link or it's going to do it soon. Um, so you can go into our community um, and then ask for a part. Um, there's many people uh, there who are more than willing to, to create parts. Um, so if, if it is a very complex part, uh, you're not sure, um, just feel free to, 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 to request some parts. We sometimes uh, you find a, a good soul, uh, or actually most of the times you find a good soul um, in, in the community that will, that will do that for you. 
Um, or another option is to um, import a part. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm not, uh, let's see, see if I can do the uh, very, very quickly, uh, just to show you um, quickly the process. We have other videos uh, that we're gonna share um, after, after the presentation is done, exactly how you, how you import a part. Um, but basically uh, we can import Kai cut parts. Um, so if you go to the data sheet, uh, of this specific part, this SW um, 6124, uh, we can see that it's a QFN 6x6 package, which is kind of a pretty standard, um, pretty standard. 5x5 five five is more common, but 6x6 six six also exists. So what you can do is you can actually go to or SAP EDA uh, or KiCad or, um, and basically search for the package that you want. So in this case, QFN 46 millimeters, uh, and you can see that this one is basically exactly what um, what we need. So we can basically just go into the part um, and then download the symbols. Um, you, what you need to choose is uh, KiCad and V4 uh, and later uh, is the one that we that we support. Um, so once you download that, um, the process is actually pretty simple. Um, what you do is you go to Flux to import library. I have already downloaded it here, my desktop. Um, and then I select the lib and I will have my own very own version. Um, of the part. So this is where kind of the concept that I was sharing before um, make, make a little bit sense. So what it imports is just the terminals. Uh, the, the lib only contains information for the terminals. Um, so if I go to the PCB, um, there's nothing still. So the process for importing the rest um, is pretty straightforward. Um, so you, you see here that bottom, um, bottom right, uh, there's an assets window. Um, so you can actually add more assets. So I can add the footprint asset and I can add the uh, 3D model asset. Um, and once those are done, um, it's a quick um, process. You basically go to the objects, add footprint. And I'm also gonna add the model. Um, so the foot, as soon as I add a footprint, I basically have all the terminals that I have here um, as paths in my footprint. So what do I need to do to create the, uh, the actual footprint? So I need to add a rule, um, which is asset, and then select the footprint asset, and then boom, um, I have my footprint. And same thing with the model asset at, and then I think it is this one. And then if I go to my 3D view, I might have to rotate it. Did I put the right asset? DPS something. I think I put the wrong, um, yeah, the wrong asset. Uh, I think so. Yeah. Let's go back. Nico, try to refresh your browser. No, yeah, I put the wrong. Uh, the wrong asset, I think. So, team. Right, I'm gonna figure that that one out, but um. No, it's just not copying what I wanted to copy. Come on, can do it. 
that is the asset that I want. There we go. All right, so we have the asset. Um, the problem is that it's kind of rotated. So the only thing that I need to do is to uh, rotate it. It's probably 90. Yeah, and there we go. Um, so this is basically how you import a part from um, Kaika in this case. So just to close it um, and try to leave some um, some time for um, for Q and A. Um, so of course I I didn't fully um, I did all the parts for for the whole project uh, because that just might take it will probably take a lot more than uh, forty five minutes. Um, again, I'm going to share the finalized sort of project with all the parts inside. Um, but something that's very interesting to do if, before you even before we even move to the to next um, to the next session, uh, and it's something that uh, that you can you can do as well. Um, a good uh, a good tip or suggestion is that um, you basically manufacture. So basically, you go and export. Um, the Gerber's uh, in the bill of materials, and then you either at least manu so manufacture the the, uh, the board, and then get it, even even if it's not routed, not um, the layout is not there, uh, just it's a bunch of parts. Uh, it's very important that you manufacture the board, um, get it shipped, and then test that all the footprints are according to what. Um, so this is basically a trick that not everybody does. Um, but it's super, super helpful. Um, the quickest and various thing would be to print it in a piece of paper uh, and then manually see that the footprint fits. Um, the ideal scenario while you work on the full schematic and while you work on the layout is to get it manufactured uh, and see that the holes work for each footprint, that the paths are the right size, um, and so on and so forth. Um, so this is regardless of your use, actually if you're using Flax or whatever tool. Um, something that um, most of the times we forget uh, or don't, uh, don't think about doing, uh, but it will save us many, many headaches in the future. Um, so that is kind of what I had for, uh, for the session. Um, so I see that the chat has been pretty active. Um, so we have um, some time for, for Q&A. And uh, just remember that so officially the session ends at uh, now in five minutes, but we're all gonna hang out here for, for some more time. Um, and um, to talk about projects or questions or whatever. So should I go through the chat? Is there anybody that has any questions? I'm also curious to hear if anybody's planning to, um, to use flags for a specific project. Uh, do you have any project in mind that you want to uh, use flags uh, or any project that you want to use to test how flags goes? Uh, this feedback will be super helpful. That could be like general questions too. It doesn't have to be just about what you saw today. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go through the chat to see if there's anything that we missed. As far as using Flux for anything, uh, sorry, my microphone is messed up. Uh, as far as using Flux for anything, uh, I, I intend to use it and hopefully produce uh, our next uh, production board uh, for a job we have at work. Well, I can just say can repeater at this point. Uh, it's, uh, it's a little more, but um, awesome. yeah. 
it's a CAN bus repeater. Uh, I've already had some help from people here and uh, Lance, you, I think, introduced me to the individuals who helped me get as far as I have. And I'm gonna bring, uh, bring some more parts in and hopefully get that together. And in the next month or so, hopefully go into uh, production with one of them. That's awesome. Can't wait to see it. I'm excited too. And uh, the uh, end user is uh, very excited about the project. So we'll, cool. uh, we'll see how it goes. We've got some comments here. Adam says immediate, just to test it out, making a rechargeable LED diffraction ID badge. Nice. <laughs> Sick. <laughs> Johnny says, I recently got into keyboards and I want to use Flex to redesign my own split keyboard, PCB. Wow. Um, Virginia says, can you show us the final version of this project so that we can see what we're shooting for in the class? That's a great question. Um, so I don't have it fully um, laid out or anything. Uh, basically, the, the final version is, is this. Um, so I think I shared the link already, uh, but this is, this is the final, uh, final project. Um, I have most of the parts um, and some of the layout, uh, but I can show it because it's not, <laughs> it's not done. Um, but if, if that's helpful, um, as soon as it's done, probably by Monday, um, I can share the, um, I can share the link um, way, way before next class. Uh, so you can decide if it's something that you want to stick out for or not, for sure. Good suggestion. Adam says, though, later I'm wanting to make some power reporting modules for solar lights. Awesome. And then Virginia nice. says, I'd like to design a radio with a class E amplifier. Nice. nice. Jarwin, Jarwin's worked on plenty of radios. Yeah. It's like ham certified and everything. Um, so Adam, are you planning to use, um, sort of like, is this like a sort of wi wireless module, um, to report how you're going to, like, how's the, the structure, uh, that you're planning? Uh, because uh, we have another, um, member of the community doing something like this, but for, um, um, kind of agriculture so basically same yeah wireless modules connected with sensors and then basically a home base or um gateway uh to collect information from a bunch of sensors and upload it like super iot yeah <laughs> exactly um it's cool i mean i actually worked on a um something along those lines so uh it was a uh, a use case where we had a bunch of cameras, uh, like kind of traffic cameras uh, in the city that would measure uh, volume of traffic and then classify with AI, um, the different vehicle types and so on and so forth. We have like a bunch, like few thousand uh, around a uh, few cities. Um, one of the points that we had was that the power of, that we were using from that, um, so the power source for, for those modules were uh, was a bit um, unstable, and we designed another small module uh, that was battery powered um, that would just measure if the main uh, processor had power or not, and then would that communicate via. I think at that point it was Sigfox that went dead. Uh, it would communicate that to um, to our backend to figure out if a sensor would was down because the sensor was down or because power was down. So uh, if you need not, any help with that, happy to happy to help. I don't want to veer off topic uh, or interrupt that conversation if uh, it keeps going. I am curious. So uh, I know that there was an enclosure uh, I think course where uh, fitting the PCB into the enclosure was a, a thing. Um, 
how about wiring? So I do a lot of wiring diagrams lately, like harnesses. Uh, mm -hmm. Is there capability currently, or uh, will there be future capability for doing uh, just wiring harnesses and uh, even complete, you know, enclosure, PCB, assemblies, wiring harness assembly? Yeah. Um, maybe I don't know if, if Brooks or uh, Matisse are here. Uh, I'm not sure that is on the roadmap, uh, but then maybe they can share a bit more, more light at, uh, around that. Um, good question. I, Hi there. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, we have no plans in the short term, but I think, you know, we'd always love to learn what exactly your use cases are. Uh, and I bet Brooks would be curious, you know, so we can see how we can fit this into the roadmap. Um, what do you think, Brooks? Well, maybe Brooks isn't here. Yeah, I think Brooks had to leave. Yeah, we can pass it on and Brooks can follow up. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, on that one, there's some uh, intellectual property that I can't share that's uh, it, some use cases that, that you know I'm using every week. Uh, currently using some other software, but it, I'd like to bring as much over to Flux as possible. But uh, you know, I understand there's still a uh, little ways to go, and there's some features that may not be added. But I'm using Rapid Harness right now, and mm -hmm. uh, I, I it's okay. But I, I'm a fan of Flux, so just seeing what uh, what the capabilities were going to be. Can I ask something real quick? Would you be looking for something like a, uh, like almost like a bus feature where you could just have like multiple wires kind of go into one wire for, for organizational purposes? Yeah, great question. Um, we have discussed that, um, but we haven't built it yet. That said, um, you should be able to build yourself bus portals. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not sure anyone has done that yet. I'm here, Nico or Jarvin, I want to maybe jump in, but uh, yeah, uh, it's possible to build a bus portals. Yeah, but I think I think we haven't done an example of that. Uh, but I'm going to take a note uh, to do that uh, and then share the part. Um, basically, just a, a portal, um, if, if you were aware. So basically, a portal is a way to kind of wirelessly connect to different um pins right so let's say that i have this this pin then this pin um what i do is i find a portal this is the right portal right yeah uh and then connect pins. Yep. Sorry, it was on the other side. <laughs> um, then add another one. And then if I call them the same, it's kind of like a net label. Some, some other tools call it like that. Uh, and I call it test. And then I call this one test as well. Uh, and you can see that the, all the traces are connected to each other, right? It's kind of like a net label um, property. Um, and I'm going to make sure to create an example of a bus doing uh, with portals uh, and then share. It's a bunch of nice, interesting projects going on here. It's amazing. And I guess uh, what Chris actually uh, was referring to, I guess you're referring to buses, right? Wherein you can connect multiple wires into it and then you can actually like output them to the ends of that bus, like a thick wires that is like different on an ordinary wire. I'm not sure, Chris, if yeah. that's the, yeah, that's, that's the one. I was 
I was talking about, like, it's kind of like you have like, let's just say for it's for organizational purposes, instead of having like 15 individual wires, you'll see 15 ends of a wire on one side. And then it um, like, uh, I guess pinches into like one thicker wire. And then on the other side, you can see those 15 outputs. So it kind of saves space and designing and it's easier to track when working with like larger wiring harnesses. So I know Flux right now doesn't support something like that. Portals is definitely the closest thing, but uh, I'm not sure if it's been discussed yet. Frankly. Yeah. Um, so basically what, what we can, so the way I was kind of thinking of approaching it, you can create a part that is a bunch of portals that you link basically one mm kind of big portal that you like, you put all the different wires uh, or nets of the bus, let's say, into that part, and then you have another part. Uh, it's oh. basically like a, a triple portal, let's mm -hmm. say. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. It's kind of a bus, uh, a bus mm -hmm. um, um, symbol in that. I mean, it works pretty similarly. Okay. Uh, so, so what you're saying is you like use, uh, make a part with a bunch of portals in it already and then mm -hmm. reuse that part in another space. Yeah, yeah. that would definitely yeah. work. I'm going to take a look and see if I can get that done and if it's clean enough uh, in measure. It okay. will definitely awesome. work if you have a fixed amount of, of channels. Yeah. Right? Like mm -hmm. What's not possible right now, I think, is to make something with a dynamic amount of channels. But you know, Correct. we're doing a lot of work here to enable more, like you know, smart components, parameterized, uh, uh, parameterized components, and that might be something that you can do in the future for sure. That would also be very good for like um, specific connectors as well. Like if you already have a connector in mind, the static approach may be even favorable because you can just load in all the the connector information and basically just have it there so you wouldn't need to like pretty much reinvent the wheel every time you want to use a new connector you can just once you use that part you're like this is how many pins i have and this is how it's gonna do it yeah yeah, yeah exactly yeah. that's exactly the idea right that you just pick one connector generic on the canvas and can then just configure what type it is and how many pins it has that's exactly what we're working towards to here yeah, the pin header is kind of like the ideal candidate, right? Uh, you can have one row, two rows, three rows, and then whatever, many columns. And it's basically the same thing, just repeat it. Um, and the, the, the traditional approach is that you have 200 different parts for all the different combinations. Um, you need to find the right one. Rapid harness happened. Interesting. And just this tool. I will say, uh, I asked about the harness capabilities of Flux, but um, after using rapid harness, it is uh, it's pretty capable uh, and pretty quick, pretty easy, pretty intuitive. Uh, you can pretty much just jump in being a beginner and not have to uh, go through much <laughs> documentation. So that 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 is nice. Um, just a FYI. Cool. Yeah, I haven't haven't seen that tool before. I've done a little bit of wiring harness uh, related work with uh, one of the cars I'm working on at my university, and definitely like. As of right now, like when it comes to measuring like length of wires and like, I guess like the assembly of wires itself is definitely more oriented towards a wiring harness program. But if it's looking, if you're looking just for, um, as of right now, like just connectivity and like not necessarily the length of components and the wiring harness itself, that's where Flux would probably excel. Yeah, I've got uh, projects on both ends of the, ends of the spectrum. I uh, have projects that are literally just wiring harnesses uh, <laughs> where I need cut links, strip links, connector ends, crimp pins, mm -hmm. the bomb for all that. Yeah. Uh, and then, then I've got, you know, PCBs uh, that are, you know, oriented towards flux uh, enclosures. Uh, and then I have assemblies. Uh, I have projects of all the sorts. So uh, that's... 
that's why I asked about the wiring, but you know, it wasn't a bad idea just to even the, you know, designators off the connectors. If I am, uh, having a harness that comes in, uh, just labeling them, you know, uh, C1, C2, whatever, um, using designators for now would, would get me by. Mm -hmm. Any other like first impressions from anyone, you know, after seeing the demo, if you haven't seen flux or any kind of like high level thoughts. I don't know if Eric, Eric, is that how you say your name? Or a Hello. Doriani? I think Matias, Matias would be able to pronounce it properly. But we'll uh, stick with it. <laughs> <laughs> one of those weird German things. Um, yes, no, it, it looks pretty straightforward. Um, so, so we'll we'll have to see. Like uh, in in terms of uh, questions, I'm I'm running uh, on on a Linux desktop. Are the is it in general running well? And if yes, what browser would I use to make it work best? Mm. Good question. So, who, who wants to take what? that on? <laughs> Go take it away, Nico. I was going to say that uh, yeah, it, it does work. Um, we mo most people use Chrome and it works pretty pretty well. But um, like I I've been testing on Firefox and Safari, well Safari is for Mac, um, and it works just as fine. Uh, but Chrome is probably the um, the most widely used. Okay, that that's doable. Yeah, you know we aim to support all of them, but. Uh... The nature of the beast is that internally, most of us, a lot of us use Chrome, you know? Um, so yeah, in a pinch, you know, uh, a trial Chrome. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I'll stop using my Internet Explorer 5. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, please. Cool. Any other thoughts? Maybe A. Doriani. I'm probably saying that wrong. <laughs> what was that? William? Oh, just muted. Oh, nothing. Sorry. I just joined. I was in a meeting before. <laughs> oh, no. I was just curious what, what everybody's working on, like the type of projects that you're working on. I know we got some satellite people cubesat kind of projects we got I think some lighting ones some battery ones um iot iot related or industrial stuff. iot yeah. just trying to get a sense of like what this group is uh, most interested in we kind of speak to it in later sessions well one of one of my projects i'm working on is a hobby project but uh there's basically with machine learning there are pretty good ways to remove uh noise and I have a, a Swiss military truck and basically I have to have a headphone on, otherwise it's, it's just you scream at each other. And so I experimented with using AI to remove noise. And I think with a Raspberry Pi, it's powerful enough to make the AI run um, to basically remove noise from my headset in real time. And so I've been experimenting with USB sound cards, but it would be nicer if I could have something that's basically a hat for the Pi with essentially just three, four sound cards that take the analog input from the microphone, headset and output, and then essentially run uh, mix in, remove noise, right? So you can uh, have an intercom and then also mix in, act as a headset, right? So someone could connect with their phone to that unit and then place a phone call, for example. That's amazing. I've seen something similar, but done with uh, one of the NVIDIA uh, boards. I think it was like the NVIDIA Nano. Was it the Nano? Um, I've, I've, yeah, yeah. I, I've, I've seen it. I've seen it. And obviously, it's the DSP solution. Um, mm -hmm. But they're, they're just um, I, I've, I've looked around for a long time for essentially something that is not straight up from the 80s. Right. Often you have like a box <laughs> and my truck is significantly louder going 50 miles an hour versus four. And in it and, and it's I, I don't want to twiddle the Vox knob all the time. Right. It seems like we're we're, we're not we're not in the 80s anymore. And. Basically, anything on the market is, is kind of really like stuck in that in that 
and they're still a thousand dollars these these units right and so i figure i'll just for my at least for myself i can i can do better than that right so um, By the way, is, that, is that a pin scour you have yeah huh. that's awesome I've, you know a friend of mine has three pin scours he's a huge fan obviously <laughs> yeah yeah um I'm, I'm not there yet my, yeah, my friend have, is only two <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's like, you know, well, you have one and two for spare parts, you know, um, but uh, yeah, they're very loud. I've driven that thing once so loud. Yeah, and, um, and in general, they're really reliable. So I just buy the parts because you can buy them here in, in Vallejo, right? And everything's still available. So so I haven't had a need for a second or a third, except for just, you know, wanting one. But but yeah, so so that that's my project. Um, but, you know, strictly, strictly hobby, right? So um nothing commercial so it's it's more i think it would be a, a good sort of like additional tool to have in my in my arsenal to know how to design at least simple pcbs for sure and we we're happy to help um so if you decide to take it on uh we're, we're here to, to support you um we, like, thank regardless you. if it is um commercial or not so yeah, be, be careful what you what you what you promise right now. <laughs> I take you on. <laughs> please please do, please do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that does sound like an awesome project, though. It's really cool. So, yeah, feel free to join our Slack community, and um, I mean, we've had a bunch of people. We'll keep on doing that for sure. Thank you. Oh, someone here working on a PhD research. Uh, for the printers. Print body pack for the change the sound print the BMS. Nice. Also as well, I'm, I, I won't even try to pronounce your name. Uh, I don't want to uh, mess it up. <laughs> but uh, also, like, feel free to join our Slack community. Uh, and there's a bunch of people there that uh, that can help you out and um, help you go through finish line. What types of radios are people interested in working with? Are these modules or are there some more of people or uh, what types of standards are people looking to work with? The wild crowd here. <clears throat> All of the above, I suppose. Well, I could talk about radios a little bit. <laughs> yeah, let's do it. Since everybody else is so loud, I um I've done a little bit of assisting with design on some small low power. Uh, HF transceivers and um, HF is the area I'm interested in. There's a lot more being done with it than there was for a while. They're starting to realize that it's a lot more versatile than they once thought. So that's one of my areas I'm interested in. Um, the class E type high efficiency uh, RF amplifiers and just learning about that. I'm, I'm pretty new. I'm, I'm, uh, like a second year EE student. So I got a long way to go, but, um, <laughs> but this is a great way to learn if you're doing things where you're actually, I like the, I like the, the project here, the, uh, Raspberry Pi, uh, battery module. I think that could come in handy because I, I'm just now starting to learn about microcontrollers and Raspberry Pi and Arduinos and, teensies and all that stuff so i i i'm 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 drowning but <laughs> <laughs> trying not to drown in all the excitement all the neat stuff i'm learning so yeah there's a lot of stuff going on in ee and i will say for me personally second year was the hardest i don't know about anyone else on here but uh yeah i just finished up my second year and it was it was it was a lot 
Yeah, that was the rough one. Um, but there's a ton of EEs in the Slack community. Um, everyone there is happy to help out, even if it's not Flux related questions, just a fun group to be a part of. Okay, that'll that'll come in handy, I think. <laughs> yeah, homework support also. Yes, <laughs> tutoring services. You, 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 you said that, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> he did I'll, not volunteer. <laughs> yeah, I'll put myself on the hook for that. I think it's fun to watch people get excited about EE stuff and bring more people into the party. So always happy to help out on that stuff. Oh, and I do, pre I do appreciate the brand new satellite nerd channel <laughs> on Slack. That's pretty great. I'll enjoy that. Yeah, welcome. I'm trying to make up for past sins. When I was in college, I focused on digital systems and software to the point where my advisor would tell me, take more engineering classes. And <laughs> we didn't have uh, computer engineering at, uh, there at the time. And uh, so now I'm trying to make up for past sins and learn all that stuff that I should have paid more attention to uh, back when I was in college. My advisor is probably somewhere in the beyond his invisible hand pushing me toward finally take some of the <laughs> RF classes and power classes that I that I missed. <laughs> That's awesome. I got a lot of friends who took that route actually straight, got an EE degree and then went straight into full on software. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my master's was computer science. <laughs> oh nice. Yeah, mine specifically radio. i I'm on an online program that that the degree, the EE degree I'm taking is specifically for wireless communication design, which I was pretty excited to find that. So um, I'm still I'm still trying to get through all the weed out classes. Have you gotten some good file systems yet? Mm, not yet. I'm I'm still just I'm I've been a ham radio operator for quite a few years, so I know a lot about radio, but I've still just got a lot to learn about just how all this stuff gets done. I'm, I'm still really, really new at everything. Oh, nice. Yeah, well, well, what helped me a whole lot was that file system. I, I went to I went to all those fraternities and sororities and they all had file systems there. <laughs> and I would just like copy and paste them. They came in real handy doing those practice problems. All right. Well, there are plenty of, there's so much online that the stuff on YouTube is, you can get a university level education for free on YouTube if you want. More than yeah, one. My, <laughs> my, my professors posted their lectures on YouTube. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I was like, well, okay. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. So I'm, 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 uh, I'm overwhelmed. And at the same time, I really enjoy all of it. So I'm, I'm gonna, I think learning this and doing some projects on my own will be uh, advantageous for sure in the future. You're lucky because there's a lot of stuff that would have made a lot more sense to, to it if I had been a ham before I went to college, as, as opposed to taking up ham radio long after. And now I look at this as like, oh, that's what that was about. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. When you actually can do radio, I, I've heard of people who get like, you know, a PhD in like antenna design and they've never touched an antenna and it's like, get a ham radio license. <laughs> well, yeah, Burns, I think, worked on the AMSAT hardware long before he, he was able to actually get a station together to make contact with it. <laughs> so yeah. there's always to approach it. Yeah, that's for sure. I'll say uh, I don't know anything about ham radio in particular, but uh, I, I do have a friend that's retired engineer. Uh, he got into aerospace, but that that's his hobby is uh, is radio, and I've got his uh, oscilloscope that's helped me out with some of my projects here. But uh, he, he's a good source when I uh, when I need uh, need to call him for uh, noise and things like that to try to get rid of it. He he definitely knows uh, knows how to do it, and I don't. So I wish that I uh, knew more about it. Well, it's a learning hobby. So, you know, there's so much stuff that people have done over the years that you can always find something that you don't know how to do that you'd like to learn about. And if you can't, you can always invent something and teach other people about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Write some software, I, I'm... digital protocols, whatever. I'm not into uh, software as much as uh, inventions that uh, 
don't exist yet. I, I am out there uh, with quite a few things. Five uh, GLT. I just post some stuff in the chat. Uh, Lower Wham, but autonomous vehicles, things like that. Um, I, I I'm in that area, uh, but I think honestly, learning a little bit about ham radio uh, might benefit me in the future. Yeah, you guys are talking about ham radio. I wonder if any one of you are like aware about Morse code. Oh my God, two person actually laugh. <laughs> yes, I'm I'm a I'm a Morse code operator. Oh, nice. Yeah, it, it took me three years to act. <laughs> Morse code still exists. Yep. Yes, and it's yep. very widely used. I, it's the safest, you know, way of communication right now because peeps are not no longer, you know, uh, learning about this stuff. It's very hot. You know? uh, when we do have to backtrack and learn some Morse code and ham radio. <laughs> Morse code is still the the most reliable weak signal mode. It uses the least amount of power, and so you can. You can get a signal much further on the same same amount of power with Morse code than any other. Some of the digital, some of the new digital modes are that way too. But Morse code is you, all you need to do. Morse code is a switch. And yep. and a lot of like people who've worked with middle school and high school students discover that they really enjoy learning Morse code. I think it's because it's the secret code the teachers don't know. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's fun to make the beeping noise. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it sounds cool. <laughs> yeah, it's been on my list for quite a few years. And, and uh, now that I actually know other people who know it, I, I have a chance of maybe finally getting help learning it and practicing. But it's, it's on my to-do list. There are some fantastic uh, clubs that do online classes for Morse code. CW Ops is one of them. They do Zoom classes and it's a lot of fun. And you get in there with five or six people that are in the same boat you're in. And and uh, it's it's really great. It's a great way to learn it. Yep. I'm going to have to yeah, find some hobbies to uh, set aside so I can backtrack, learn some Morse code, learn ham radio. It actually might uh, help me uh, with my, my current situation. Yeah. Uh, also, what fascinates me about Morse code is like it's because it's just tones. You know, you can actually like communicate to a person located at the other side of the world just using like five watts of power. Yeah. So I've it's heard. very like I mean like oh my god, you don't need like the new technology right now as long as you know you have equipment to send Morse code basically. Yeah. Last weekend there was a big worldwide Morse code contest on. And there were people cranking out like thousands of contacts. And I was, um, my goal was to see how many different countries I could make contact with in one weekend. Uh, I got 30 different countries uh, with 50 watts just on like in a 24 hour period over the weekend. So it's it's fun it can be kind of fun too just to see see what's out there well done well done yeah it still depends on the propagation you know <laughs> nice schematic yeah, pro propagation is propagation is good right now the solar cycle just started back up and uh, propagation was terrible for several years and in just a year's time it's gone from almost nothing to crazy good so this is the time to get your ham radio license all of us who just got started five years ago when things were horrible horrible yes have no place to go but up exactly <laughs> you get on uh, now and you're gonna be doing good yeah I, my my house i we're building a new house in ohio but uh but like my room i made a i have a tv antenna port that's directed directly just to the to my roof so that's going to be my ham radio antenna for a while <laughs> we had them build it in gives me happiness i've started to play with it so i might be asking for pointers at some point because i only have like one of those like cheap bow fangs and i don't really know how to use it so i'll be asking questions at some point yeah, well there are any publicly shared uh schematics or anything about ham radio on here on flux uh I'm, I'm interested. 
Yeah, I'll be sharing some of the projects that I already built here in Flux almost, I mean, related to satellites, ham radios like PTT controls, you know, push to talk, automatic controls using just your computer that is like uh, tied to a uh, software defined radio. Some of those, you know, peripherals that is like, you know, uh, cost some something like 200 bucks. You can actually like get it like for like 50 bucks or something, you know, as long as you know how to create those boards. And you know, uh, utilize the modern kind of chip, you know, the chip technology. Yeah, I'm, go I'm going to share those one on the Satellite Nerds channel. So you guys wanted to check that out, join the channel. Yes, join the Satellite Nerds. I'll put some stuff on there too, just for fun. Yeah, cool. I've seen videos of, of uh, kids with two HTs and a handheld arrow and that's how I do it. It, I made I made my antenna. It's it's a it's a made out of copper, number nine copper, and I just have two HTs and that thing, and I, it's so easy. Yeah, they make it seem hard, but it's not really that hard. Yeah, so that's something you can do with a technician license, inexpensive hardware, and uh, you just have to learn where in sky to point things. And there's Cell, cell phone apps that'll tell you that. Mm -hmm. Well, if that's the case, what do I do with all my expensive hardware? <laughs> well, should we wrap up, Nicholas? Yep. Um, we've created all the channels to continue the conversation. So uh, love to see that. Um, keep happy to over there. Right, well, thanks very much for the class. It was nice to meet everybody. Looking forward to trying this out and learning more. Nice to meet you too. Sounds great. Nice to meet you. Yeah, great to meet you all. Yeah, it was, uh, I I'm glad to see the turnout this time. Glad to meet you all. That's a fun crowd. <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay. See you right. next week. Goodbye, Later. everybody. Have a nice weekend. <laughs> Sorry, Scott, what is that?